Welcome to this podcast brought to you by the Journal of Healthcare Contracting, and now our host, publisher John Pritchard. Hey guys, this is John Pritchard with the Journal of Healthcare Contracting. I'm excited today to have Dave Piercing on the line with me. Dave's the Chief Medical and Technology Officer at Cepheid, and he and I talk a little bit about how the rapid testing world has evolved and become imperative for health systems to be great at testing. Dave, thanks for being with us today. Let's jump right in. How has PCR rapid testing changed because of the pandemic, and how did we get to where we are today? You know, it's really it's really interesting um, to see the evolution of uh, molecular diagnostics over the past few decades that I've been involved with it. Um, I, I like to say that it's now known at, at the public level the difference between PCR and CPR. They actually know the difference now. <laughs> PCR is, uh, has been the cornerstone of molecular diagnostics uh, for many years, but it really hasn't hit the, um, hit the headlines until COVID hit. Um, and, and that's really for good reason because it's, it's, uh, it's more sensitive um, and uh, that can be viewed as good or bad depending on the circumstances. But in the setting of sick patients coming into the hospital, um, you really do want the most sensitive test. You don't want a test that's going to miss a case that's admitted to the hospital, not in respiratory isolation, so the regular ward, and then to later find out a day later that they're COVID positive. That's not a good thing. Um, so uh, having a really sensitive test up front on admission <clears throat> is really important. And that's the, um, the, the role that PCR plays these days in, uh, in COVID and really has been driven uh, in that direction because of the pandemic. Uh, I will say that prior to COVID, um, influenza uh, seasonal influenza was our biggest challenge. And the same idea applies there, that there are less sensitive tests that can be used to diagnose influenza. But in the hospital setting, you really want the most sensitive test because you don't want to be surprised. You want to know whether the patient is eligible for an antiviral, whether they need isolation or not. And and how they are managed after admission is, uh, is very much dependent on getting a, an accurate result. And that's often driven by molecular methods like PCR. That's very interesting. You know, you touched on something there I'd like to dive a little deeper into. Why is it so important to get rapid testing accurate? Well, it's, it's, um, it, it, there's an old, an old saying, um, that you know, a company may say, we have rapid and we have accurate, which one do you prefer, uh, rapid or accurate, not both. But now having the combination of accuracy and speed is something that these methods offer that really didn't exist before. And, um, and that's, that's the difference is that you, in the past, you always had to make sacrifices in sensitivity and performance in exchange for speed. Uh, e even with that drop in sensitivity, sometimes the decision was made in, the, in favor of time to result because the results are more actionable. Clinical action can be taken more quickly. Whereas waiting for a, an ultra sensitive test based on PCR that had to be sent to a lab and got back two days later was just not actionable from a medical management standpoint. So now having this combination of, of uh, the best in class sort of laboratory quality accuracy along with speed is a, a really unique combination. What are the three to five things a supply chain leader really needs to understand when evaluating testing platforms? Well, obviously uh, test availability is, is, uh, is one of them. And um, I think, you know, the entire uh, world saw a major 
manufacturing squeeze and uh, constraints on supply uh, during COVID. Uh, Cepheid was among them, but we were uh, flanked by many of our, um, of our competitors that had similar supply constraints. Uh, it, it's not just the tests though, it's the stuff that goes into the tests, it's the swabs, it's the transport media, all of which experienced supply constraints during, uh, during COVID. So looking at sort of the entire workflow uh, from um, sample collection to testing is important uh, to get a perspective on from a supply chain perspective. Um, obviously tests, tests that, that contain all those materials with the test kit, the transport medium and the swabs together as a, a single package on a per patient basis uh, is important because that means that you won't have situations where you have tests but no swabs or swabs but no tests. You're, you're gonna have them linked together. One of the other things that um, I think is gonna be important is to consider the versatility of the, uh, the platform that is being used in hospitals is how does that platform go back and forth between uh, seasonal uh, presentations of viral infections versus out of season uses of that technology? How does it go back and forth between the current pandemic and, uh, you know, God forbid, the next pandemic? Um, how, do, how do those systems stay in use during that period of time? Because ideally, when, you, when we have to, if we have to respond to the next pandemic, uh, it needs to be on the basis of a system that's already in the hospitals, that's already in use, that so-called warm testing capacity that's used for so-called peacetime wartime scenarios where you use it for routine testing for chlamydia, gonorrhea, uh, viral load, um, healthcare associated infection, C. difficile, those, uh, those kinds of applications in between pandemics. We saw during the, during the pandemic where there was a demand shift away from healthcare associated infections and tuberculosis testing toward COVID testing. We saw a reduction in chlamydia and gonorrhea testing because of COVID. Part of that was because patients weren't showing up in clinics, but also there was just a natural demand shift toward uh, the, uh, the, the pandemic um, response. And, um, and, but it, it's all predicated on having a system that can do it all, that can respond to a pandemic, uh, but also can be used uh, for other applications uh, outside of pandemics. And uh, having the personnel trained and on site, having a system that's easy to use, that can run tests on demand uh, is an important part of that, that, uh, that formula. Very interesting. And I'm going to ask you now to look a little bit into your crystal ball and looking to the future, what is Cephia doing to prepare for the next pandemic like crisis in the healthcare industry? Yeah, it's a really good question. You know, Cephia has uh, a long track record of responding to um, emergency threats. We, uh, we were um, engaged early on after the anthrax uh, scare in uh, 2001 to build a test cartridge that could test the mail for the presence of anthrax. We were um, early in uh, responding to the threat of drug-resistant tuberculosis. Uh, starting in um, 2005, we, we started a project that would target um, drug-resistant TB. In 2009, we uh, built a test for H1N1 influenza. In, 2000, in 2014, we built a test for Ebola. Uh, and then uh, more recently, we uh, responded very quickly to the threat of COVID. So, but we feel that it's, it's really important to build in uh, to uh, the tests that we design, to build in sort of a future-proofed um, capability that enables us to be able to detect things that 
may not yet be on our radar. So for instance, our influenza test uh, for influenza A, B, um, uh, include, which also includes respiratory syncytial virus and COVID, the so-called fourplex test, already has built into it capability of broad range detection of influenza A virus. Uh, influenza A virus is a category of influenza virus that includes avian influenza. So all the bird flu scares you hear about um, have not amounted to an, an avian flu pandemic, but because the virus is out there, the potential exists for it to cross over into the human population. And we need to have tests that are ready to detect it uh, that are already in routine use. So um, every time you run a Cepheid test uh, for flu A, flu B, RSV, and COVID, you're actually running a test that covers many influenza A viruses, including uh, avian flu viruses. And that enables you to be able to detect it in circumstances where other tests, especially immunoassay tests, uh, will, will just miss it. And uh, we learned our lesson after 2009 H1N1 when many of the antigen tests that were out there for flu lost most of their sensitivity. The CDC reported that test sensitivity went down as low as 11% and was uh, hit hard by the change in the antigenic structure of the flu during that season because the lateral flow tests that were, were in use uh, didn't have antibodies that could recognize that particular strain of virus. So by building in this broad range capability into nucleic acid tests, we can avoid that problem of missing um, variants that exist uh, out there, including influenza variants and COVID variants that may appear in the future. Dave, this has been a great conversation. Thanks so much for sharing your insights with us. Listeners, I want to take a quick second to thank Cepheid for sponsoring this podcast. We wouldn't be able to bring you guys such relevant, timely content without partners like Cepheid. And always, thanks for tuning in.